the the father who owned the vehicle probably had no idea that the girlfriend was operating it. It didn't really matter because he had an obligation to know. Hello and welcome to the next episode of Beneath the Law. My name is Gavin Ty. I'm here with my colleague and good friend Stephen Teal. Um, today we're going to talk about a case that came out really underlining a very serious issue. Um, and, you know, everyone knows, sadly, that uh, automobile um, accidents uh, are prolific. Uh, tragically, many people get injured in automobile accidents. Um, and there's a very highly developed you know, law, and certainly this, there's literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of automobile accident cases out there where the law is very, very well developed in that regard. And in addition to that, the requirements for drivers to be insured is highly, highly developed. And there's a reason for that, unfortunately, because the sad truth is that accidents and injuries cause enormous economic uh, losses and cost uh, an enormous amount of money uh, to not only compensate the victim, but when we talk about compensating the victim, we talk about things like future care costs, which is the sense that if somebody's injured, um, sadly, uh, there's an expense associated with their care in the future. Uh, and that is in oftentimes in personal injury cases, and it, a huge part of the uh, damage award is what is it going to cost to look after this person into the future? Uh, there's also loss of employment income in the sense that that person may not be able to work uh, further and that therefore you have to have some source of income to carry them through for the rest of their lives. Um, now, when we get into other, we see lots of other vehicles that are out there on the highways and the byways. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, as in, in the city right now, I know there's just a a explosion, for example, in these electric bikes that are all over the place. And from what I can tell, you don't need a license. You don't need an insurance policy to have one. But you you know that there are going to be injuries with respect to those bikes. You know that people are going to get hurt. So there are lots of other vehicles. There are snowmobiles, for example, um, here in Canada. There are ATVs, which are uh, all-terrain sort of buggies. They come in all shapes and sizes. People ride them around on all sorts of, uh, you know, back roads and rural properties and stuff like that. And people do get hurt, uh, very seriously hurt. So a case we're going to talk about today is out of the Ontario Court of Appeal, and it dealt with an ATV accident, and it led to a very serious uh, injury on the part of the, uh, of the rider of that. And the question becomes, what do you do? Whose fault is it? I mean, the rider was with a, you know, probably were operating the vehicle, you know, what, what, uh, what, what rules should be in place? Who at the end of the day is going to be responsible for that riders or that passenger or that driver's injuries? So Stephen, maybe you could tell our listeners a bit about the facts of this particular case. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I just want to back up um, uh, with respect to, to your comments uh, about uh, uh, cars. You know, we have insurance. But uh, most owners may not necessarily think about insuring an all-terrain vehicle or a snowmobile or a jet ski. And uh, this case really um, is educational uh, to owners of these recreational vehicles um, that they really should be uh, uh, examining uh, insurance and significant insurance because uh, recreational vehicles uh, can result in accidents by users uh, and serious accidents. So the case um, uh, that we're uh, discussing today is uh, uh, DeRoche versus McInnes, uh, which, uh, as you mentioned, Gavin, came out of the Ontario Court of Appeal. And uh, what uh, the background of that case was, uh, it involved a young woman uh, who was riding her boyfriend's ATV, uh, well, it wasn't her boyfriend's ATV. It was actually owned by the boyfriend's father. And that's really why this case is uh, uh, meaty from uh, a liability perspective. 
the boyfriend uh, had basically uh, uh, had her uh, at the farmhouse, the farm property in rural Ontario. Uh, they drove uh, the ATV down. The boyfriend was driving to uh, collect a family truck uh, that was parked at the edge of the roadway of the farm property, uh, rode the ATV across the field, and then uh, collected the truck. Uh, but, of course, somebody had to drive the ATV back to the farmhouse uh, uh, while the boyfriend was driving the truck back uh, to the farmhouse. And so uh, he had the uh, his girlfriend ride the ATV back um, uh, uh, to uh, his parents' uh, farm. Uh, the girlfriend, a young woman, did not have very much instructions on how to uh, uh, ride uh, an ATV. Uh, the only uh, instruction that she had was fairly minimal, uh, and it was always under the supervision of uh, the boyfriend uh, or uh, the boyfriend's mother, um, and always at slow speed. I've never driven an ATV, but I understand that uh, you've got to really shift your weight sometimes uh, with respect to being able to turn one of these uh, things. They're, you know, they're not light vehicles. I think they're very heavy ones. Um, but it takes some skill uh, to, to ride this. Anyway, uh, the boyfriend really didn't give uh, his girlfriend any instructions on how to ride, where to ride. Uh, he had come across the field. There was a nearby roadway, uh, and the girlfriend uh, drove the ATV on the uh, roadway rather than across the field, which was flat. The roadway actually had a steep incline and a very, very sharp, uh, S-curve, and uh, as uh, the girlfriend uh, rode the ATV up the hill uh, and uh, 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 had to turn on the S-curve, she wasn't able to do so because she had not been given proper instructions on how to properly uh, uh, make that kind of a turn um, at a higher rate of speed rather than a slow rate of speed uh, and crashed into a tree. Uh, she was not wearing a helmet uh, and uh, suffered a very serious brain injury uh, because of that. And so uh, the family and the uh, young woman, as you can imagine, uh, with a serious brain injury, um, uh, you know, required a lot of medical care and support. And so they sued uh, both the boyfriend and uh, the mother and the father uh, for negligence. Uh, with respect to the use of this all-terrain vehicle. And at the uh, trial level, uh, while the boyfriend was found uh, to have owed his girlfriend a duty of care uh, with respect to making sure that she had been properly instructed on how to use the ATV, uh, both the mother and father were found not liable. Uh, and so there was an appeal uh, to the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, with respect to liability. Act, uh, the boyfriend actually brought an appeal, and then the family of the young woman and the young woman herself uh, brought what was what is called a cross appeal on the issue of liability of the parents. Uh, and the court, uh, at the end of the day, upheld the decision of the trial judge with respect to the boyfriend's liability and then reverse the decision of the trial judge with respect to the liability of the father, who was the owner of the all-terrain vehicle, and uh, held that uh, he also was liable for the failure uh, to have uh, uh, provided this young woman with proper instructions, uh, basically the negligence of, the, uh, of his son, uh, the uh, young woman's boyfriend, was attributed uh, by legislation uh, to the father. So yeah, that, in a nutshell, uh, it's a long explanation. Sorry, and I hope nobody got bored with that, but, uh, <laughs> but that's the background of this case. Yeah, I mean, I think that we get into the, what is, when we think of negligence in the operation of a motor vehicle, which is the term right out of the Highway Traffic Act here in Ontario, the statutory term, um, what does that mean? We, you know, we think like, oh, you, you're a bad driver or you've done something negligently when operating the vehicle. But the court went on to say that it was more than that. The operation of a motor vehicle included who you let operate the motor vehicle, that you've got a duty of care and that using the language of negligence to ensure that people 
who operate your motor vehicle, and in this particular instance, the ATV in question was considered to be a motor vehicle, um, you know, whether those people are appropriately uh, qualified to do so. And that obligation extends to persons who you give the care and control of that vehicle to. So if you hand the keys over to somebody, you're then responsible for everyone that person allows to operate the vehicle as well. As the owner of the of the vehicle, you've got an obligation to ensure that the people who operate it are capable of doing so and qualified to do so. And if you, if they're not, you've got exposure to liability. Um, and that ultimately, I think, was the 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 key takeaway of, of the case of the case here was that the the father who owned the vehicle probably had no idea that the girlfriend was operating it. it didn't really matter because he had an obligation to know. Yeah, it's and well, and and, and uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, uh, not only did he have an obligation to know, but uh, uh, the obligation was to basically ensure that whoever used that ATV uh, had been properly trained um, uh, to do so, and essentially to say to his son, "Look, uh, please don't uh, allow uh, this ATV." Uh, to be used by anybody else uh, unless uh, uh, unless the person is properly uh, trained and instructed. But, you know, look, I mean, uh, uh, most children, it's very uh, hard to uh, get them to do anything uh, in terms of following instructions. So, uh, you know, you do have to take responsibility yourself sometimes uh, uh, in terms of uh, making sure that, uh, you know, it's the young woman's, uh, uh, your son's uh, girlfriend uh, that the likelihood of her uh, operating the vehicle uh, may be high, that you should take some responsibility. Uh, the reason that, I, you know, that I like this case, Gavin, um, it's almost like, uh, you know, we talked about uh, in one of our other episodes about escaping golf balls and uh, and responsibilities of uh, users of golf courses and, uh, 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 you know, the golf club and, and the owners of... Um, golf courses to make sure that uh, the course is designed in such a way that golf balls don't escape uh, uh, the playing field. Uh, but recreational vehicles, when I think about it, in Ontario, we have a very significant cottage industry uh, in our province. And it's not uncommon uh, in the summer uh, months to be inviting your friends up to your cottage and uh, to use your toys. Right, whether it's a jet ski uh, uh, or an ATV, or in the winter time, uh, a snowmobile, and you know uh, your children, uh, you know as they get older, they're riding around on on these um, uh, uh, recreational uh, uh, vehicles or uh, watercraft uh, uh, would be the legal term for for a jet ski, and you know young people, their friends want to ride them. And, you know, because it's fun and it's exciting. Uh, but uh, these are very, very, uh, just like a car, uh, they can be a very dangerous um, uh, form of transport. And people do need to have proper training. And you can't just jump on one of these things and all of a sudden, hey, you're the best skilled uh, uh, jet ski uh, person uh, or ATV driver. Yeah, I'm going to suggest to you that they're probably more dangerous. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I know with, uh, you know, uh, skidoos and snowmobiles, um, the speed that they can get to uh, at this point, I mean, it's, they're not, they're not your grandpa's snowmobile anymore. I mean, these are things that can get up to like, you know, 100k an hour uh, without much difficulty when whipping across an open field. Um, bearing in mind, of course, that, uh, you know, any any collision at that speed, particularly over unregulated terrain where there could be, I don't know, rocks or something beneath the snow that you can't see. I mean, I I, I know there's tragic um, instances of uh, I've heard I've heard of this particularly where there are, are, for example, pressure bumps on lakes where ice will form and then the the ice will push itself up and have a ridge in the ice and snowmobilers go, whipping across an open frozen lake. You know, it looks fantastic. You're you're flying through it, but beneath it, there's a you know there's a wall of ice, and they literally are driving snowmobiles into this wall of ice. And if you're no, if you're going fast enough, you can only imagine 
the catastrophic uh, impact that would occur. You're going 100 kilometers an hour. There's no airbags in snowmobiles. Uh, there's really nothing to stop you. And ice is hard. Uh, and if you if you hit it, uh, it's it can be serious injury. And certainly in Ontario and across Canada, there are tons of snowmobile injuries that happen every year. Um, as one example, I mean, ATVs are the same type of thing. So I think that there's a, there is in fact an elevated risk with respect to these types of vehicles. There is no actual technical, I don't know if there is a technical, is there a requirement? Let me ask you this question. Maybe you know the answer. Is there a requirement to have insurance, liability insurance on, on these kind of vehicles, or is it completely optional? Uh, uh, Gavin, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I haven't really uh, dug into that um, specifically. Uh, but my sense is that there is no mandatory requirement uh, uh, for insurance, uh, certainly not in Ontario, uh, for any of these kinds of uh, of recreational kinds of uh, the vehicles. Look, I, I could be wrong in that regard, um, uh, but, uh, you know, looking at... Um, uh, one of these kinds of uh, uh, recreational vehicles, uh, uh, jet skis in particular, um, insurance can vary uh, with respect to jet skis. So there's no uh, real consistency like you would have um, uh, in a motor vehicle kind of insurance policy uh, that basically a jet ski can be insured depending on its, uh, I think, horsepower of its motor, uh, et cetera. Um, and so uh, those are, you know, there are certain qualifications in, in certain insurance policies uh, in regard to that particular kind of um, uh, a recreational uh, form of transportation. But um, so I'm not really aware. I don't think that there is. And this case is that uh, to me, it's the precautionary tr um, uh, 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 kind of case, um, precautionary tale, so to speak. That owners of uh, of any of these kinds of uh, things, ATVs, snowmobiles, sea doos, uh, ski doos, uh, jet skis, uh, really, when they're buying one of these things, uh, should uh, contact an insurance broker and get them insured, and they should insure them for significant amount of money, just as you would a um, uh, a car, uh, uh, because uh, injuries can be catastrophic. And from a public policy perspective uh, here, this case really, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're going to repeat ourselves with respect to uh, a number of our podcasts when we talk about the law and legislation. Uh, legislation is always a matter of uh, statutory interpretation, and there are rules uh, and principles that govern statutory interpretation. Uh, you know, all statutes are entitled to be read uh, liberally and broadly. Uh, that from a pol public policy perspective, uh, in terms of the Highway Traffic Act that governed uh, the responsibility of an owner for their uh, vehicle, and an ATV follows within uh, the definition of a motor vehicle under that act, uh, from a public policy perspective, it made a lot of sense for this young woman and her family to be able to make a claim through the father's insurance policy uh, because... There was the owner with the asset and had the insurance to basically cover her loss. So that makes uh, uh, a lot of uh, public uh, sense. It's a uh, good public policy to make sure that uh, someone who gets injured uh, using one of these things uh, isn't left, uh, uh, you know, to basically the social welfare state to take care of them at the end of the day. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about that. I mean, that's really the that's really the the key reason why uh, automobile insurance is mandatory. It's because people, you know, if you're injured uh, in an automobile accident and you need a remedy, you need that remedy. I mean, this, this particular plaintiff, this could be little doubt, would have been extremely sympathetic to the court. This is someone who, you know, was a young person, suffered a severe brain injury, uh, was probably uh, suffer from a disability for the rest of her life. I don't know what the, I hadn't read the specific details of what her injury is, but brain injuries are such that, you know, this is someone who probably couldn't work from who would need constant future care. And a court looking at that will be very anxious to find that person a remedy. And that is ultimately why uh, you want to be in a situation where there is an insurance policy 
uh, to respond to that type of a situation because the court will be looking for that remedy. And let me just turn that around for a minute, just in terms of getting people's heads in the right space in terms of, well, why should I pay for the insurance? You know, if you went to rent uh, an ATV or a sea do for example, if you go away on a holiday and you, you're going to rent a sea do for the afternoon, think about the form you've got to sign uh, before they'll rent the thing to you. What they say is you're responsible for this risk. You have, they identifies all of the risks that go into that uh, particular um use of that vehicle. Why? Why do they do that? Because it's exactly why they do it. They want to try to exclude themselves from these types of risks. And the reason is because those risks are real. Those Insurance is ultimately about risk. If there's no risk, then there's no need for insurance. And there are substantial, substantial risks with respect to this. And I mean, this could be, if we're, if we're looking at this, I mean, we're talking about potentially damages that could be in the, the many millions of dollars. Um, in terms of quantifying what the, the cost will be to look after this person for the next uh, for, the, for the rest of their life, and as a young person, that's a long time. Um, you know, this is this this is potentially financially ruinous uh, to someone who does not have insurance, because that would be a personal judgment against that person, on which it would affect all their assets. So they could lose their home, they could lose all their they could lose their their livelihood. Um, so this is these are really serious serious um, repercussions uh, and a little bit of forethought and a little bit of money spent up front goes a long way in terms of avoiding that. And hopefully you never have, and the best insurance of course is the insurance you never have to call on. Well, and, and, and that's why I think uh, look as, as an owner uh, and uh, of any of these kinds of um, uh, devices, uh, uh, vehicles, watercraft, uh, you really uh, uh, do need to take uh, some responsibility here uh, with respect to the use of, of your property. Uh, you know, in the, in the commercial sense, you're absolutely right. Uh, the commercial business who's renting you one of these things uh, is going to uh, have you sign a form and they'll take you through it. It's like when you uh, actually rent a car. Uh, you basically have to initial uh, whether you're taking insurance uh, 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 for that. Uh, and to pay for for the insurance. Now, uh, you know, uh, uh, my policy covers me internationally when I when I travel uh, for that. So, you know, I'm getting over insurance if I do that. But uh, you really do uh, need to be uh, prudent. And you know, I hate to sound like a fuddy duddy uh, uh, if that's uh, if that's a term that uh, 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 Google it and then you'll know what that is. Um, uh, but people have to be responsible both as owners and as users. Uh, you know, I'd love, I'd love to ride an ATV, uh, but I gotta tell you, if I'm going to do that, uh, I certainly want to have some form of instruction or, you know, if I go to a, um, a sunny destination where they're surfing, I'm not just going to uh, grab a surfboard and, you know, go out on the ocean somewhere, uh, and not know what the, uh, what the local issues are or without any kind of, uh, proper instruction, on how to use a surfboard. Uh, uh, so people do need to be prudent. Now, uh, in this case, Gavin, the one thing that we don't know is actually what uh, were those damages? Uh, what was she entitled to in terms of money? What was the family entitled to? Un under Ontario, we have a family law act where family members uh, uh, can be compensated for loss of care, guidance, and companionship because this case only dealt with the liability uh, uh, issue. But, you know, at the end of the day, one can imagine that the damages here are going to be fairly significant. Uh, I'm not sure what the owner's uh, insurance policy uh, was and how much it covered, but you're potentially looking at the loss of the family farm uh, if, uh, if the uh, insurance policy doesn't cover those damages award uh, that, that, uh, that uh, you know, she'd be entitled to. Yeah, a cautionary tale indeed, a tragic a tragic one, uh, but you know these vehicles are fun for a reason. They are thrilling. They are exciting. Um, and one of the things is reasons why is frankly because they're dangerous. Um, and uh, you know, uh, fuddy duddy or not, uh, you have to recognize the fact that the reason for uh, their uh, the attraction is the risk that's involved in it. And with risk, um, you know, things can go terribly, terribly wrong as they did here, and it can happen in an instant. Um, and these are extraordinarily powerful um, 
vehicles the you know that have the ability as you mentioned <clears throat> they're not particularly protected uh but they can cause very serious harm so yeah uh, and 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 just uh, one thing before we wrap up here um you know the listener is going to say well Stephen, you said that she wasn't wearing a helmet so a lot of that uh, fault should be placed on her um and indeed uh, some fault was placed on her but it was only 10 percent yeah, I mean, and then raises the issue of did she have a helmet to put on in the first place? I mean, is that part is that part of the owner's responsibility to ensure that the proper protective equipment is provided for every individual who may be either operating or riding upon that vehicle? Uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't take much to see uh, that if there's a responsibility to ensure that the, the people operating the vehicle are appropriately trained that there would be further responsibility to ensure that they have the appropriate equipment to be able to safely operate the vehicle. A- anyways, it, it, all of that is to say that with ownership of any, uh, ownership of any item that can cause others harms entails a responsibility on the part of an owner and with ownership, uh, that responsibility has to be fulfilled. And when things go wrong as they, uh, as they do, um, you should be prepared for that. So a little forethought in terms of insurance and be, be careful about who you let drive your ATV. Let's be, let's be straight about it. Um, so with that, I think uh, we'll wrap up this episode. First of all, thanks to you for listening. Really appreciate it. Uh, comments, uh, please rate us if you can. Really appreciate any ratings or feedback that makes us better. Uh, we are still uh, getting the hang of this podcasting thing, although we've got uh, quite a few episodes out there right now. At least we, we should be thanking. We have a whole pile of uh, new followers, uh, uh, is my understanding. And, uh, you know, uh, the one thing I, I do want to say uh, just uh, quickly before we wrap up, what um, we are trying to do here with this podcast is be educational uh, a little bit in terms of the law. We're not promoting our own cases. We're actually promoting what the law is all about. And, uh, you know, I was talking to uh, John, uh, one of our colleagues uh, yesterday, and he loves our podcast for that very reason. Yeah, I think the law, the law it's, it, I mean, it's often one of those things, having a commentary on what the law is. The law is a reflection of, uh, of societal issues that are important uh, and the, the courts in governing the way uh, we operate as a society and courts are provide a vital, vital function in that regard, as does the legislature, of course. So what we try to do is get underneath it, uh, take a look at these cases, uh, you know, sort of beyond the taglines or the buzzwords in media to get at what's really going on here. And for the most part, for the most part, I think the courts exhibit an enormous amount of common sense. And when you know a little bit of context and facts, those cases make a lot of sense. And we're definitely indebted to the judiciary who spends so much time and energy to uh, to come to these reasoned uh, decisions as they did in this particular case that frankly do the right thing for the most part. Uh, and this is one of those cases. Unfortunately, the right thing can sometimes be a very, very heavy burden to bear uh, if you're not prepared for it. So with that, Stephen, uh, I think we can wrap up this episode. Thanks again for listening. Um, kudos out to our producer, Doug Downs. Thanks for all your hard work as always. And always remember, if nobody is above the law, 